I'm Ben Wattenberg in London. We seem to be living in an era unprecedented in human history where a single nation, America, spans the globe as a dominant power. But historians tell us there is a precedent for everything. On this program, we talk with Britain's leading military historian, Sir Michael Howard. He is one of the world's preeminent authorities on war, power, and military strategy. From London, this week on Think Tank. Today we are at the Royal Society of Arts in London. Joining us is Sir Michael Howard, president of the International Institute for Strategic Studies and former Regis Professor of History at the University of Oxford. He was also Lovett Professor of Military and Naval History at Yale University. He is the author of many books, including The Lessons of History, The Causes of Wars, Clausewitz, and War in European History. Uh, thank you for joining us. Michael. Let us uh, begin with the great German strategist uh, Clausewitz who wrote that war is the extension of politics by other means. You are a Clausewitzian uh, expert, sir. Can you first tell us what that means and then uh, does it still apply in this strange new world? Yes, he said it to make it clear that war is not just a game. It's not something which takes place in a kind of vacuum governed by its own laws. That uh, wars are fought for purposes and they are political purposes and the political objective has got to impregnate the whole of the conduct of war. Now the difference is that when he wrote at the beginning of the 19th century, he was thinking about war between states. Now we have got war within states. And I'm afraid it is perfectly true that if one looks at the former Yugoslavia, war is being conducted there as politics continued by other means. The politics of the individual separate ethnic groups attempting to assert their independence, extend their, extend their range, and assert their individuality and using force to do it. So the answer, short answer is yes. What Clausewitz wrote is still valid. Is it still valid in terms of war between states in an era of nuclear weapons? I, you, you have written that war is much less likely in the modern circumstance because the weapons have become so horrific. Uh, certainly war between states uh, armed with nuclear weapons is less likely because neither side sees any political advantage to be gained from a conflict in which they're likely to suffer at least as much as their adversary. But other types of war between lesser armed states, as between Iraq and Iran, or between Iraq and the coalition put together five years ago to keep Saddam at bay, is still <laughs> happens, and I'm afraid it's likely to continue to happen. Why can't we put a coalition together to do something about Bosnia? I think very largely because the whole Bosnian situation is infinitely more complicated than that in the Gulf. The Gulf was a wonderful simple situation. In the first place there was a single adversary, a bad guy straight out of central casting, Saddam Hussein. You only had to see him on the box to know that he was bad. Secondly, there was an absolutely straightforward infringement of international law with his invasion of Kuwait. And thirdly, the oil resources of the Western world were at risk. Now, now put that together and you have got a full, uh, a, a full flush. Plus a, plus a program to build nuclear weapons, just as, uh, exactly. as an added yes. kicker. I mean, right? you, 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 you couldn't have a better scenario. Bosnia is such a mess. Uh, it is by no means clear uh, which side is right. They all have got very good cases. The whole um, uh, conflict escalated uh, suddenly from low-level confrontation. Um, by the time it was realized that we had got a war on our hands, and by us I mean the international community, it was by no means clear what ought to be done about it, and there were totally different views between the Europeans and the Americans and the Americans and the Russians. Uh, we got dragged into it for two reasons. 
first a general sense on the part of the international community that there is an obligation on our part when one does see suffering and, 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 uh, and, and tensions and, and, and death that we should intervene to do something about it. Secondly, a fear, which I personally think is greatly exaggerated, that this was going to be a forest fire that would spread indefinitely unless we did something about it. Now, my own feeling is that if we had left it entirely alone, we would have reached within possibly six months, certainly a year, the conclusion which we are now reaching today. That is to say, a war which is settled on the, uh, on the spot within the theatre um, in accordance with the balance of power, with the strongest guys who aren't necessarily ever the nicest guys winning. Uh, if, if Clausewitz uh, and, and political warfare still obtains in civil situations within a nation, and as you say, uh, between nations because of the, uh, or between big nations any, uh, in any event, because of the threat of nuclear weapons, uh, the war is less likely than ever. What is, uh, I mean, is the game worth the candle? What are we, we, we Americans and we as an international modern industrial democratic alliance, uh, what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, what? we in the West are trying to accomplish is the continuation of a peace which is very much to our advantage. Uh, we are the winners uh, in a succession of wars. We have established a global dominance which suits us very well, which enables our economy to flourish, which enhances the lifestyles of our people, and what, what we want is to preserve that. That means we're in favor of peace, we're in favor of the status quo. There are, however, always going to be people in the world who see themselves as losers, who don't like the status quo, and who try to disrupt it. Uh, if they have no, no other means, they will try to disrupt it by force. Is it, is it merely status quo, or, or is it in our best interest that this way of life that, that you describe, uh, dealing with the democracy and markets and individualism, uh, isn't it in our best interest that that, that philosophy be extended as well as uh, maintained? Uh, it is in the general interest that it should be extended so far as it can be extended. I think there's a certain um, optimistic feeling that ultimately the whole world will be like us, will think like us, that the uh, Anglo-Saxon type democracy is going to be the answer for everybody irrespective of their race or culture. That is something that I, 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 I myself do not necessarily believe. I think cultures are too diverse. I don't think that Western type democracy goes down necessarily in Islamic states. I don't think it goes down necessarily in Confucian states all of them have got their own ways of doing things. What matters is that we should have a global system in which they all, whatever their, their philosophy, feel comfortable and are comfortable with one another. Well, I, yeah, I, I would certainly not be in favor of imposing uh, an external culture, but if you have a global situation now where, for example, American movies and television are uh, are, are dominant, they are everywhere. I mean, I guess in, 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 in Europe, 80% of the box office receipts are going to American movies, and the same is true in these non-Western countries. I mean, g uh, give or take a few percent here, uh, here or there in, in Japan, in Asia, in, in, in parts of the Muslim world. Uh, isn't it plausible that given this uh, communications revolution, that these ideas will indeed spread globally? Well, the image which is projected of the United States by your media is not one which is uh, universally welcome, acceptable, or admirable. I think everybody enjoys watching American movies. I think everybody enjoys the, uh, uh, the, the Am Am American culture as it is spread, but the lifestyle which is depicted there, the human relations which are depicted there, cause genuine shock and disapproval my mind, not unnaturally, uh, in, say, Japan or in China or in India. They don't want to be like Americans if America is as it is depicted on Hollywood movies. What should America's role in the world be now? I mean, the Cold War is over. 
for, for most of this century, we uh, Americans and the modern industrial democracies had a clear cause. There was totalitarianism of the right and yes. of the left, and it was clearly defensive. With all that, that change now, what, what ought we be doing and why? Can, can, can I answer this by saying what I think America is doing, um, whether or not it ought to be, and then perhaps we might look at the, at, the, at the ought side of it. America is still infinitely the most powerful community in the world. It is the only superpower. It is deeply engaged throughout the world, whether it likes to be or not. Uh, there are occasional nostalgic hankerings after isolationism in certain areas of the United States, but it is impossible. You've gone too far. Your economy is too tied up with that of the rest of the world. Uh, your culture, as you quite rightly say, is tied up to the rest of the world. You are part of the world community. Um, now, as part of the world community and as the most powerful element in the world community, you are enormously influential whether you want to be or not. And it has always struck me that the American elites, the intellectual elites, business elites, all the rest, uh, are very happy about being involved and indeed are very active in enhancing this involvement. There is, I would have thought, practically nowhere in the world where the United States is not heavily involved economically, socially, culturally. Uh, certainly in all the trouble spots of the world that one goes to, the money which the United States is pouring into it, the goodwill, the technical know-how is immense. And uh, that seems to me what you are doing and what you ought to be doing. That is to say using American wealth, technology, expertise to assist the rest of the world uh, to uh, so to identify its problems, help to solve them in so far as you can. Now, sometimes I think you tend to go overboard in believing that the American model, as you indicated a little earlier, is going to be all right for everybody. And the American desire to spread democracy throughout the world is something about which I always have certain doubts. But uh, the American but, desire... But, I mean, uh, isn't, it, isn't it useful to uh, not to inflict it, but to offer it? Oh, well, it is there. I mean, whether you offer it or not, it's people can see, can see it. If they like it, they will take it. So I don't think you need push that one. But I think that what does need to be offered and is always on offer is American know-how, American technology, uh, Ameri uh, uh, American money, uh, all those things to be available to A the world. A lot of, of that is related culturally to American openness and American political democracy. I mean, th those things don't operate, I don't think, in isolation. Uh, that again is, if I may say so, a certain conventional wisdom. Uh, but uh, one only has to go to somewhere like Singapore uh, to see a country which is very prosperous and very happy and booming economically but does not believe in American political standards uh, and does very well without them. I would have thought probably the same will apply in the People's Republic of China indefinitely. Uh, the, the, the American desire to turn the People's Republic of China into a Western-style democracy observing all human rights as we, as, we, as, as we understand them does seem to me to be totally counterproductive. Well, if, if you look down the road a decade or two or three, uh, and you say, who could possibly threaten this global democratic alliance that we, that we enjoy? It seems to me you come up with China, that that is the biggest uh, alien force uh, in the world. And it, that would be a, uh, a much more uh, amicable situation if the Chinese, they don't have to be, uh, you know, have an American political system. Uh, certainly not. But if they had a more open, more democratic situation, wouldn't that be safer for us? Well, it would be a great deal nicer, but don't expect that you're going to get it. Um, I think that it's not a black and white situation that we're looking at. On the one hand, you have got a peaceful, democratic, cooperative China. On the other hand, you have a totalitarian, threatening China. I think that 
there is a wide spectrum of, 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 of possibilities in between, and I do not see why one is not going to have a continuing authoritarian China and a prosperous China and a China which is competing in many respects with the United States, but whose uh, economy is involved with the United States as closely as that is other parts of the world, in which there is no threat as such. Again, one of the problems, it seems to me, is that, if I may say so, Americans are always looking for threats. Uh, okay, there's no threat now. When's the next one coming up? Well, why should there be one coming up? Uh, Sir Michael, you, you said that Americans are always uh, looking for threats. Uh, Speaker Gingrich said something recently that I'd like your comment on. He said, you do not need today's defense budget to defend the United States. You need today's defense budget to lead the world. If you are prepared to give up leading the world, we can have a much smaller defense system. Uh, and it seems to me the thought you raised about a threat and what Speaker Gingrich is saying are related. If there is no threat to the United States, how do we go to the American public at an election time and say, oh, by the way, please drop $250 billion per year into the Pentagon. Why, 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 I mean, why should we do that? Well, frankly, it does seem to me that you are spending <coughs> an unnecessarily large amount on your defense budget for the very simple reason that having built up uh, a defense structure of that kind, it's extraordinarily difficult to exit without causing a great deal of unhappiness and, and, and uh, economic dislocation to all the interests involved in, in, in keeping it going. Um, and if you were to start from scratch now, I very much doubt whether you would have the size and the structure and the, uh, and, and the expense of, the, of, of, of the, um, the armed forces which you at present have. Do, do you think that uh, America today is a, uh, a declining power or an ascendant power? We I, had a great big argument I about know that in the did, States. Yes. Is America again, in decline I, I, and everybody was crying? I, mean, I, don't, I don't accept either of those adjectives. I think it is a changing power. It's a changing power reacting to a changing world. Uh, that uh, You did achieve uh, an enormous military uh, uh, presence and capability in, uh, in, in facing down the Russians, which you very successfully did. No, we, we did. We, we the, 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 the NATO alliance. That's very kind of you to say so, but well. basically the Americans did. I mean, it was American technology and power, and it would be nice if the Europeans had contributed more, but I'm afraid we didn't contribute all that much. No, you did it. Uh, as a result, you grossly overextended yourself and overspent yourselves, and you've now got very considerable problems as a result of balancing your budget out of, after that. But although you are now deeply in the red and are getting more deeply in the red because you'll find it impossible to cut things that you, for political reasons to cut the things that you, that you ought to cut, you still are the major maximal power force, I would say, in the world. And uh, you're not declining in relation to anybody else. And if there is no, uh, nobody out there by whom you can assess whether you're rising or declining. As I said, this is, these, these are no longer really re re relevant uh, considerations. Ha, ha, has there ever been, in, in, uh, in recent history or in human history as recorded, a nation as relatively powerful or influential on a global scale as the United States? Uh, well, I hate to say it, but yes. Uh, Britain in the 19th century. Very comparable situation. Uh, that uh, we were unique in our capacity to project power anywhere in the world, which we did. Uh, we didn't, I'm glad to say, attempt to do it in North or South America. Um, that was uh, sagacious of us, and we might not have been sort of terribly successful. But, uh, but everywhere else, uh, thanks to our maritime supremacy, thanks to our, uh, our lead in industrialization and technology, Britain dominated 
for about 50 years, from 1815 until uh, 1870, 1880s, when the Germans and the, and the Americans started catching up with us. What, what, uh, what lesson should we Americans take from that English experience in the 19th century, when, when indeed the English were uh, the most dominant power in the world? I'm never happy about, about, about lessons, you know. Um, all I can say is say what, what happened. Well, what did happen was that uh, inevitably uh, we lost our unique status because competition arose from other people who, as I say, the Germans, the Americans, uh, who um, worked harder, who were more up to date with upcoming technology, in the case of the United States, had vastly greater resources and, and reserves. Than, than England did. Than, in, the, yeah. the, than England. In the case of Germany, it simply worked harder. Uh, and we then felt ourselves challenged, and uh, that challenge and the perception of that challenge was one of the major causes, I think, of, 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 of World War I. Um, I suppose one could say that sooner or later you're going to have to accept that there will be somebody who is catching up with you in various respects. And if it does happen, don't panic. Uh, that don't see them as being necessarily threats. Now, Britain saw Germany as a threat, if only because Germany felt that they could only assert their, their status as a world power by uh, dominating over England. We didn't see America as a threat, although it was far more of a threat. We adjusted to, first of all, American equality and then American superiority in uh, what some people saw as being a rather uh, uh, cowardly fashion, but others saw as being sagacious. Uh, so um, I think the lesson you have to draw about that, as from anything else in the past, is flexibility. In a world where people see through television the blood and the guts and the horror of military action so clearly in their own living room, uh, does war th and the projection of military power have a uh, much of a future? I mean, we, we saw in the United States uh, a few Marines being dragged through the street in Somalia, and that was the end of Somalia because of the television cameras. It, it, has that uh, uh, diminished the ability of great nations, big nations, any nations, to, uh, to project power and to use force? Well, I think you have got to define the nation and the culture that you're talking about. Well, say England. Um, I think that in Western Europe and the United States, uh, it certainly is a disincentive to get involved in war. But I think it is much more so, if I may say so, with the United States than with the Europeans. We have had in, 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 in Bosnia several dozen British troops killed. It hasn't affected our will to go on there. We are, I think, rather more used to having our forces killed. Uh, it awakens, if anything, a, a sort of a a desire for revenge or determination to go through with the job. The, the body bag factor, I think, in the United States is particularly acute. And it is something which does very considerably reduce your influence in the world. It is no good having this marvelous great capacity for power projection, this enormous budget. Uh, which uh, Mr. Gingrich says is necessary to lead the world, if when the moment comes you'll say, well, we're going to lead the world so long as no American blood is spilled. Go on and do it yourselves. That isn't exactly leadership quality. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sir Michael Howard. Got it. And thank you. Please send comments and questions to New River Media, 1150 17th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. We can also be reached via email at thinktv at aol.com or on the World Wide Web at www.thinktank.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg.
This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.